Hello friend. In this lecture I would like to talk about nanostructures. Nanostructures of solids. And these really come down to a set of four kinds of nanostructures. And I'd like to organize them in a way that's right from the start pretty straightforward. All right, let's write those four down. First of all, there's the zero-dimensional nanostructures, and these would be particles, or perhaps dots. You've probably heard of nanoparticles or nanodots before. There are those nanostructures that are one-dimensional. For example, wires, tubes, or rods. There are those that are two-dimensional. What do you think that's called? Well, they're called nanosheets, plates, slabs. And each of these has multiple um, names, as you can see. And then lastly, there's three-dimensional nanostructures. And what do they uh, look like? Well, of course, it depends on what that three-dimensional nanostructure is. So let's turn to the first of these. Particles, or dots. All right, well, what do these look like? Well, these have, you know, a structure. They'll look like, like this. Uh, quite often, they, when viewed in, a, in an electron microscope, they have a kind of crystal faceted structure. But what's key about these things in general? For, first of all, their size is very small, and that's a few nanometers to perhaps tens of nanometers, right? So very small. And of course, they're built up of um, different numbers of atoms. And the key thing about these that is really important as far as nanotechnology is that there is a huge surface to volume ratio. And that influences their properties tremendously. Both their interaction and their own properties. All right, so let's try to draw some atoms in a nanoparticle. I'm going to draw three different kinds. All right, this might have, for example, 13 atoms. And if there are 13 atoms, then there are 12 atoms on the surface. Basically, almost all of the atoms are surface atoms. And that really has a big impact on the properties. Of course, we can also have larger atoms, I mean, I'm sorry, larger particles formed with a larger number of atoms. <coughs> For example, a total of 55 atoms. And in this case, there would be 42 on the surface. And I hope you're not surprised that these would have very different properties. And then lastly, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to draw this, but much larger particle. I'm not going to be able to draw all of these atoms. But of course they are to be thought of as being in a crystal structure, but it's just a very small crystal structure. What about 147 atoms together? Well, in that case, there's 93 on the surface. All right, so quite a bit more than half are on the surface in this kind of relatively larger particle. And I guess we can even draw what this looks like in general. If we have this axis is the number of atoms in the particle. And then in this axis, we have the surface atoms. 
or the atoms on the surface. What does this look like? Well, if there's a few number of atoms, as we've just seen in these three examples, we have a large number. If there's a large number of atoms in the particle, there's a low number of surface atoms. And so this looks like a curve that goes down like this as something like a one over, um, one over the number of atoms. So the smaller the particles, the more atoms are on the surface. And that's really important to their properties. And I want to give you an example of that for gold. Their melting temperature depends on this tremendously. So let me graph two things here. This first graph on the left will be the particle diameter. And of course, the particle that has a smaller diameter has a fewer number of atoms than the particle with a larger diameter. And this is the melting temperature. All right, what does this look like? Well, the key thing to remember is that those particles that are very small are going to have a lower melting temperature, by a lot, in fact. And those particles that are larger will have a higher melting temperature. And this difference is actually very big. So for large particles and bulk gold, we need a very high temperature to melt it, relatively high temperature. Um, and for small particles, for example, down here, this could be 200 Kelvin. So even at room temperature, these particles, if they were small enough, for example, 2 nanometers, they would melt spontaneously. All right, so the size of the nanoparticle determines its properties in this case. Um, the second graph is also for gold nanoparticles, and this is the surface to volume ratio that I want to graph here, and this is the melting temperature. And really, it's another way to graph this same kind of effect, and it turns out that this is a line with a negative slope. And of course, it means that those particles with a high surface to volume ratio, which would be over here, correspond to those particles that have a small diameter. And of course, those that have a low surface to volume ratio are those with a large diameter. So really, same data, just two different ways to look at it. Key point is that the melting point of gold particles depends very much on their size. Now, a single particle by itself is not the only form of a nanoparticle. The other kind, or at least one other kind, are colloidal particles. And a colloid, a colloidal particle, these are particles that are a mixture of two different phases. So most commonly, it's a solid and a liquid, but it doesn't have to be. Could also be a gas. And this mixture is often referred to as a soul. And sometimes this can also be a gel, or in, um, and then that would be called a soul gel. Perhaps you've heard of that before. Now, the particles 
make the material do something. So for example, could absorb and scatter light. Or the particles could make the colloidal mixture more viscous. And as I mentioned, the solution can be or the liquid this can be converted to a polymer network usually a uh, low density polymer network And actually, a polymer would be just one kind of, of this kind of network. So I'll just say that's for example. But the solution can be converted to a network. And and in this case, that is called the gel. And if you've ever eaten um, gelatin pudding or jello kind of... Uh, of a food that is this kind of liquid where there's a network structure to it. All right, let's talk about wires very simply. Well, wires, you know, it's it's really very similar. Um, of course, wires can take many different forms, but these also can have a high surface to volume ratio. whether they're rods or uh, belts or wires. And it's very common that they're used to construct sensors and other devices. And that's because not all of the outer portions of the um, of the structure are surrounded by the surface atoms that might be the sensitive ones. So for example on either end of a nanowire there could be electrodes applied while along the body of the wire um, this could be where a sensor could be arranged. And we'll look at an example of that in just a moment. So these are very commonly used to construct sensors and other devices. such as transistors. And nanowires of metals, semiconductors, or insulators can exist. And shortly we'll look at each of these.